if you don't think that this is a spiritual issue, that money and how we handle and deal with money is a spiritual matter, uh, then you really don't understand Scripture. Uh, it really is. Because what we do with our money, how we use our money and our time, is a clear indication of our walk with Christ and what we believe about God. It's not so much whether you like or agree with the, the, the preacher at the moment or the pastor at that moment or, or whether you like the church or agree with the church. How you utilize your money, how you invest your money is really a reflection of what you think about God. And I want us to catch that this morning. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to the book of First Timothy chapter 6. Uh, and we're going to look at verses 6 through 10. Uh, we're going to jump into the book of Matthew and the book of Mark. We're also going to look into uh, Thessalonians as well, several passages that are there uh, as we reflect on this one key passage of Scripture, that the love of money is the root of all evil. But as you turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, so let's just pray. Father God, thank you uh, for your love and grace. And we thank you that uh, you have a message for us today. Speak to our hearts, challenge us, encourage us. We ask this in your name. Amen. Uh, as we, just before we get started, uh, just to remind you, next Sunday we start a new series. Uh, and if you want to kind of get a jump start on it, uh, you're going to go to the very last book of the Bible. You're going to look in the book of Revelation. And uh, we're going to start looking at the seven letters to the seven churches over the next seven weeks. Uh, so I invite you uh, to go ahead and, and, uh, and begin to study that. We have a number of small groups right now that are studying the book of Revelation. And so this kind of runs in tandem with what they're doing. There's a, a group on Sunday evenings, a group on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday mornings. And, and I think the, there's another group that's about to start on Sunday mornings uh, or soon to start on Sunday mornings working through the book of Revelation as well. Uh, it is the, it's the one, uh, there's one passage of scripture in there that says that as we read and study it, we will receive a blessing. Uh, and, and so we want to receive a blessing from the Lord, certainly. Uh, I believe we're blessed any time we open His Word, any passage any, of, of Scripture. Uh, but it's specific about that book, as, uh, as John was writing that. Uh, and so I encourage you, uh, bring a friend or two or seven with you next week uh, that they can jump in at the beginning of this study as we look at seven letters to seven churches and what that means for us today. Uh, I believe God has a special uh, message for us during this time. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. And I'm going to see if I can see these. So uh, I'm trying something new. I broke down, made my daughter Sarah proud when I went and bought these. Because now I can read. Wait a minute. I've got to tell you this story. I'm sorry. <laughs> Is it okay? Can I, just, can I just talk today? Is that all right? Um, after I read scripture, I will talk. But before that, I have to tell you the story because it's an amazing story. Uh, we had the opportunity, Dan and I did this past week, to go to the American Association of Christian Counselors World Conference uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, it was an amazing conference. I uh, got to hear some incredible speakers. It ended with Johnny Erickson Tata speaking yesterday. And uh, what an incredible, incredible woman of God uh, to hear as, as she spoke. Uh, there were moments of... Uh, in some of the speakers of just sheer laughter. Deanna, what's the name of that one lady? I've got to go find more things that she has taught on. Li yeah, she is the uh, funniest woman I have ever encountered. For 30 minutes, we laughed from the beginning of her message to the end of her message. Uh, Liz Curtis Higgs, and uh, she's a really divine woman of God. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, was, it really was an amazing, an amazing conference. And um, uh, I told, uh, told Deanna at the end of the, the week... The, uh, they had men speaking and they had women speaking and the women far outshined the men in their speaking. Uh, God's power was so evident. Uh, but Deanne and I went a day or two early so we could drive over and, and see our little girl, see Sarah, make sure she was doing okay at college. And, uh, and so I, I, she shared this story and I thought, you know what, I've got to share this story. So uh, this, you want to know how Sarah's doing? Sarah's doing just fine. Um, she is um, known by everybody on campus 
Uh, she had decided that she would not run for president, even though that was one of the things that was on her plate, and people were saying, you should run for president, and so she said, no, I'm not going to do that, and she was written in. I mean, people did write-in votes, and she came in second anyway, and, uh, and she said, I, I guess people know me, and I said, yeah, I guess so, and so she said, she said you know, the other day, Dad, uh, Mom, Dad, I was, you know, everybody does know me. This was Friday week ago. She said, I was, um, I had these, these two uh, students came over. These guys walked over to me and said, hey, Sarah. Um, you, you know everybody. And, and she said, well, yeah, I do. Now, understand, Sarah, she said, listen, Mom, Dad, I, I know the people at school that are really good, and I know the people at school that aren't so good, okay? And just want you to know, I mean, I, I know everybody. And, I mean, it's a campus of about uh, 13 to 1,400 students. And, and so, and so these, these two guys walked over and said, Sarah, you, you, you seem to know everybody. And she said, well, I guess so. And she, they said, do you know where the party is at, uh, out near University of Kentucky? Now, by party, it was not a Christian party, just so you know, and there was an intent that there was a lot of things that were going to be going on, and, and uh, so, but they figured that Sarah knew everybody, and so, so Sarah said, well, uh, um, yeah, I, they said, do you, do you have the address? And she said, well, I've got an address for you, just, just a minute. And, uh, and Sarah then went back to her dorm room, and, and she had visited First Alliance Church in uh, Lexington. And, and so she went through, and in there she found the address to a Bible study that uh, she then walked out, and, and she said, okay, here's the address, guys, and she sent this address to these guys, and uh, so Friday night, a week ago, those guys went to that address. She said, Dad, it was the complete opposite direction than where the party was, as far as I know. It was nowhere near University of Kentucky, and she said, so they drove over there, and they spent an hour and a half at a Bible study. She said, they came back the following day, and they said, Sarah, you sent us to the wrong address. She said, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> We went, and, and it was a Bible study, and it was a bunch of older people. We couldn't leave. <laughs> and so we just came back here after an hour and a half of Bible study. And Sarah said, well, you know, okay. <laughs> Sarah's doing just fine. <laughs> she said, I'm doing my own version of evangelism. <laughs> and I thought, wow, I love you, kid. That's awesome. So if you want to know where parties are, they happen in Bible study. And, uh, and so uh, let me give you the address of a party this week. It's 4400 Buffalo Road, and it's a Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. <laughs> uh, but she's doing really well. So thanks for, uh, for praying for her. Uh, and uh, what, a, what a cool story. And I told her, I said, honey, I'm going to share that story. Uh, so if you are ever wanting to know addresses to someplace that it's not a Bible study, <laughs> Sarah's not the one to talk to. So. Um, so what I, what we thought the Bible said, money is the root of all evil. Anyway, nonetheless, I made Sarah very happy when I picked up some glasses so I could read some. First Timothy chapter six, verses six through ten. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And then over in 1 Timothy chapter 3, let me just share this with you lest you think that's the only time the Apostle Paul talked about that in this particular book. As he was describing overseers and deacons, he says this in verse 3. Describing overseers and deacons or elders, he says, they're not to be given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. I think that God has a lot to say about money. And for us to get a full understanding of this, uh, we just want to look at two things. First is this. It's a heart issue. It's really not a financial issue, but it's a heart issue. Somebody once upon a time said, God doesn't want your wallet. He wants your heart. And if he has your heart, he'll have everything. It's true. The Lord owns a cattle on a thousand hills. 
He created everything that there is. He doesn't need money, but he wants your heart. And so when it comes to financial things and when it comes to money, how we use money, how we invest it, what we do with it in regards to church and and the like, all of those things, it is a reflection of our interaction with Almighty God, our opinion of God, our faithfulness to God. It's a reflection of those things. The Apostle Paul, as he's writing to Timothy, this young preacher, he's pointing out a number of these things. So it's a heart issue. And the question that you will need to answer is this. Who is God in your life? Is God God or is money God? Or is something else in your life God? But how we invest our time and our money is a clear indicator of how we feel about God. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21, it could be a very familiar story to you, but but in this particular passage of Scripture, it's the story of the rich young ruler. Jesus, as he had been teaching, uh, share, I'm sorry, not Matthew chapter 6, that one's coming up in Mark. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21, Jesus, as he is teaching at the Sermon on the Mount, he he says the following things. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, say it with me, there your heart will be also. Steve Green wrote a song years ago, Where Your Heart Is, There Your Treasure Will Be. It's really true. We invest in the things that are important to us. We build our kingdom. We invest in in a variety of of ways and and, uh, items and, and belongings, or we invest in people by our time. All of those things, those things that are important to us. We put time, money into relationships, that we believe are most important. I put time into being with my children because they're important to me. I invest financially in my children because they're important to me. And you do the same thing, right? I would hope so. You invest time and money into the things that are most important. So let me ask the question, how much time and how much money do you, or or where does the majority of your time and money go? That would be a clear indicator of what's most important in your life. If it's in entertainment, it'll show up. Large screen TV, entertainment systems, movies, those things aren't bad, but when you invest all of your, so much money into it, building that man cave, or, or again, all those, there's nothing wrong with those things, but when you invest all of your, um, so much of your money and your time, your effort, all of those things in the things that really don't matter, it's an indicator that that really has taken root and taken the role of God in your life. You said, that's not true. Well, yeah, it it really is. Because we give to God what's most important. We give him our time. Or do we not give him our time? Where your heart is, there your treasure will be, is what Jesus said. This was a revolutionary thought to the people that were there. And and to further that that particular illustration, it goes to Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 23. This is the story of the rich young ruler. I find it very penetrating whenever I read this story. Because here this young man comes and, and, and wants to follow Jesus. And it says this, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, 
how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, God is not, Jesus is not speaking uh, anti-wealth. He's not declaring that wealth is a bad thing or a wrong thing. He talks about the difficulty that it is for those who are of great wealth, those who who have amassed that particular uh, amount that's around them, how difficult it is for them to follow him, how difficult it is for them to inherit the kingdom of heaven. This young man came of great wealth. Lord Jesus, I want to follow you. Just tell me what I need to do in order to inherit eternal life. So so this young man had this idea, which is a reflection on what he typically understood and lived out in life. What can I pay? What can I do in order to purchase eternal life? That's what's happening. Why would that be the case? Because everything in this man's life up to this point is something he had earned. It's something he had paid for. It's something that was a part of his uh, it was his doing. And Jesus, Jesus walks him through. You know, Abraham laid it out. Moses, I'm sorry, Moses laid it out. Have you, have you followed the Ten Commandments? Have you lived out in faithfulness to the law? And Jesus lists out just a very few of them. And the very boldly the man says, Faithfully I have lived these things out my entire life. Since I was a little boy, since I've understood, I have lived them out faithfully. And Jesus, Jesus confirms that. You have. Oh, but there's one thing you lack. Did you notice that, that Jesus didn't start with the first two commandments? Did, did you notice that? He, he, he didn't start with, you will have no other gods before me. And it was purposeful because he recognized in his interaction with this young man that there was another God that was in his life and it was all of his wealth, it was all of his money. And so Jesus, as he guided this young man through this conversation, went to the heart of the issue. Listen, what is keeping you, what is keeping you from following me, what is keeping you from eternal life is that there is another God that is seated upon the throne of your heart. And so I'm about to tell you that if you will remove that one from the throne room of your heart and you will in turn invite the correct one that is there, then you will have treasures in heaven. And so he says, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. Now, that young man says his face went down. Why? Because, not just because he had great wealth, but because he knew that Jesus was right. What, what really caught my attention in that passage is that it says, Jesus loved him. He loved him enough to step in and say, listen, I love you. I want you to follow me. Here's the obstacle. If you deal with this, if you deal with the heart, then you'll have treasures in heaven. It wasn't just that he should go and give it to the poor. What Jesus was pointing to was the greater issue of who is seated upon the throne of the heart. It's a heart issue, folks. Jesus challenges that rich young ruler. In, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul writes it this way. In, in verse 6, he said, it this, he said, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness and contentment are, are to be the defining characteristics of a Christian's life. Now, godliness, if you were with us three weeks ago, and we talked about how cleanly, you know, we talked about that phrase, cleanliness is next to godliness. You remember that, that, story, that message, and we had the different, uh, oh, the different items and articles that you use and getting yourself all clean, all of those things. You remember what, what we talked about was this, that godliness in its original meaning conveys the idea of a personal attitude toward God that results in actions that are pleasing to him. It's a personal attitude that we have towards God that will result in our actions that are pleasing to God. The personal attitude toward God is what we then call devotion to God. Not devotions that we read, but our devotion, our commitment to Him. Godliness begins with cleaning the inside. 
The rich young ruler wanted to know what he needed to do. He was busy trying to clean the outside, and Jesus says, sell everything you have because in the center of your heart, in the center of your life, there's another God on that throne. It's your wealth, and you need to get rid of that God that's on your throne so that the inside is clean so that Almighty God can take place, his rightful place there. Jesus, in his interaction with the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 26, he says it this way. He says, you blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. You see, as we looked at that message, we, we, we recognize that when we clean, if we are going to become godly individuals, it's not just cleaning up our activities on the outside. It's not just uh, that, that portion. It's getting down into the interior of the soul and seeing the soul completely cleansed. That's where godliness is going to then be produced. It's not the action. It's what takes place on the inside that produces the action. So Paul says here in 1 Timothy 6, godliness and contentment. Now, what is contentment? Well, contentment is the state of being satisfied. On Thanksgiving Day, an incredible table is set in front of you. More food than you would eat in a week. And you probably will eat it throughout the rest of that week. I mean, you'll have turkey in so many different ways that by the time you're done, you won't have turkey again for a year. That's why we only do it once a year, right? <laughs> but you'll have that. It's, it, you know, great work has gone into it. You'll sit down. You will eat that particular meal. And then you will push back from the table. Why? Because you're what? You're full. Some of you may have pushed a little too far and you're sick. But for the most part, you push back away from the table because you're full you're satisfied. You're, the, the hunger that had been there within your body had been met by the food that had been provided, and so that satisfaction is there. And, and so for a while, just before the tryptophan really connects and you fall asleep, there's an element of contentment that is there as you say to that person that's with you, thank you so much for all you did in, provide, in, in getting this meal ready. There's contentment. There's satisfaction. There's there's, you're being full. So to be contented or to have contentment is when, we find our, is when we find ourselves fully satisfied. So when do we find ourselves satisfied? I find myself satisfied when my needs are fully met. And those needs might be answers to questions. I've had a question that's been burning inside me and I ask it and I'm not going to, I, I am, I'm still a ter in turmoil until it is answered, right? I walk away satisfied once I have, I may not like the answer, but I've got the answer. I've received the answer. And, and when I've received the answer, I can walk away having been satisfied because, or content, because I've received that. I, my needs are fully met spiritually when I am engaging with Christ. And as he meets my every need, all I have needed, thy hands have provided. It's not just the physical needs, but those spiritual needs. I am content when my mind is stayed upon the Lord. As I draw closer to him, as I engage with him, and that, the spending time sitting with him, I, I find myself absolutely contented. They, maybe you've never had this experience, but I have had experiences in my life where I have wished that we could not move from the moment because I know in that moment I am seated at the feet of Jesus and I am experiencing blessed joy in his presence. And, and I don't want to go from that moment. I am absolutely, 100%, completely contented there. I remember with each of our children, the feeling that it was for me when that little one would fall asleep on my chest as we were seated on a chair or rocking them to sleep. I wasn't just thrilled that they finally stopped screaming their full heads off. <laughs> But that sweet little expression of trust that they had in me as I sat there and I held them and gently they fell asleep and their body just went kind of limp. And all of a sudden that 10 pound baby feels like they're 30 pounds. They were absolutely 100% content in my arms. 
There are moments in our walk with Christ where we lay our heads upon the breast of Jesus and we find ourselves fully at peace, contented in his presence. If you've experienced that, you know what I'm talking about. And you don't want to leave that moment. Why? Because everything is fully satisfied in that moment. There is nothing that separates me from God. My sin had been dealt with, and I am just experiencing the embrace of the Almighty. And it is so, so powerful. If you've never experienced that, then maybe it's because there's something else on the throne room of your heart. Maybe sin is what is keeping you from those moments. But I long for those moments. Sometimes it happens in the midst of a song. This past week, as we were engaged in in worship during our time away, there was a song we've sung here many times. Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. And as that song was was playing and as we were singing, I got to that phrase, through the storm, and I couldn't sing. I was overcome in that moment by the reality that in the storms of life, Jesus had promised. He had promised that he would be with us in the midst of the storm. You know, that story, where, where that comes from is the, the Jesus is, is on the boat with his disciples and they are out in the middle of the lake and the storm is blowing, it's raging in the, and, the, and Jesus is asleep in the boat because the storm doesn't bother him. The disciples are grabbing onto the side of the boat screaming for, day, screaming for, for help because they believe they're going to die and when they finally wake Jesus up, they say, don't you care? And Jesus' response is, Be quiet. Peace be still. And he asks him, where was your faith? Through the storms, he is Lord of all. I don't know what storms are raging in your life, but in the midst of the storm that you were experiencing, Jesus hasn't just fallen asleep in the boat. He is there in the midst of the boat, and he will sometimes quiet the storm, but oftentimes he simply quiets his children in the midst of the storm to remind them that he is Lord. And if he is Lord, that means that everything around you that's happening in that storm, everything that is taking place in those moments, that that storm must yield to the name, to the voice, to the command of Jesus. Through the storm, he is Lord of all. And and in that moment, the contentment just kind of struck me that in the midst of the storm that may be raging, he is there. And I can say, thank you, Jesus, that you are here in the midst of that. Godliness and contentment should be the defining characteristics of the Christian's life. See, you and I, our needs, when our needs are fully met, if they're answers to questions or it's a spiritual need or it's a physical need, we, we talked about that already and, and saw where God has provided for our needs. When we are full, when we feel safe, when we feel secure, all of those things is when contentment finds itself very present in our life, when those needs are met. But what happens when these two things that seem to be separate, come together. I mean, because Paul could have said godliness, or he could have said contentment, because we're talking about, he's moving in to talk about finances, about money, but he says, no, 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 godliness and contentment. Notice what the verse said. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. It's great gain. When the two come together, I am most contented when I recognize that God, who God is and realize that he loves me and cares for me. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34, he's going to talk about uh, uh, why do we worry about all the various things of, uh, of the world? Why do we worry about what to wear, what to drink, what, you know, how to eat, all those kind of things. He says, consider the lilies of the field. 
God clothes them. Solomon, with all of his wealth and all of his splendor, never looked as beautiful, was never cared for as much as these lilies. For God clothes them. God provides for them. Now, God had lavished upon Solomon wealth in addition to his wisdom that he gave. And so to those Jews that were sitting there listening to Jesus talk when he said, listen, look at the lilies of the field. They are of greater array in their adornment than Solomon was. Why worry? Because I will provide, is what he's saying. I am most contented when I recognize who God is and realize that he loves and he cares for me. As I clean out the interior, I become fully satisfied in Christ because he cares for me and he meets my needs. Paul would say in the book of Philippians chapter 4 that there's a secret to being content. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. Hear what Paul says to the church at Philippi. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. You want to know what the secret to contentment is? It's recognizing that I can endure, I can experience, I can go through all of life be it through Him who gives me strength. Paul said, I know what it is to be wealthy. I know what it is to be poor. I know what it is to be hungry. I know what it is to be well fed. I know what it is to be free. I know what it is to be in prison. I know all of these things. And in each and every one of these things, I have learned the secret to be content where I am. I may not like the situation, but I am content in there. It's a, it's a, it's a decision. It's a state of being because I'm reflecting that God gives me the strength. He provides what I need in the midst of those moments my friend wherever you find yourself today whether it is in want it is in need or you are experienced plenty in whatever those places you may be there is a secret to being content and it is found only in Jesus Christ he is our strength in those moments it's a heart issue when godliness and contentment come together there's great gain But Paul pushes a little bit more, a little further in this passage because we recognize that the love of money really is not the issue because the heart is the issue. Notice what he says back in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He says in verse 7, For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. Well, that was very kind of him to say, wasn't it? There's another passage of Scripture that says, Naked I came, naked I shall return. Encouraging today, right? You came in with nothing. I want to just suggest, though, that what we do leave with, Paul is speaking to the physical monetary things. We may have come into the world with a deficit, but if we know Jesus Christ as Savior, we leave this world full of riches because we leave heading to his home, heading to the place he's prepared for us. We may have come into this world a pauper, but we leave out a prince and princess because of what he's done. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 8, it says, But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. How many of you are contented just to have food and clothing? Don't raise your hand because I don't want anybody to lie, okay? That you're just content just with food and clothing. That's all I've, if I've just got food and clothing, that's enough. Because the reality is, most of us, we want a little bit more than just food and clothing. I do. I, I want to know that, that when I re- reach my retiral age, that I have something set aside to provide for me and my family. I want to know that that when I do finally pass away, that there's a little bit of something to give to my children so that they can experience some some type of blessing in that way. Now, I I think most all of us in the room have some kind of a retirement package 
that we've been working on or setting up or now we've been using. Some of us have been using it for a number of years. Are you really contented just to have food and clothing? I'd suggest that we really aren't. It's not really about food and clothing, though, that Paul's talking about. What he's saying is, is if, if I just have my basic needs met, I'm content, if I could say it that way. Because that really was the basic needs in that day and in that time. Just food and clothing. If, if Paul was living today, he might say, if I have food, clothing, and shelter, then everything will be fine. Then I can be content. Place, got a roof over my head, food in my belly, and I'm not cold because I've got clothes. I could probably be okay with that. Money is really not evil, folks. God knows that you and I need it. We live in a society, we live in a world where money is necessary. We don't barter as far as, you know, I've got chickens and I'm going to trade my chickens for uh, some milk from your cow. We don't do that anymore, do we? Well, maybe some of you do. You live out in the country a little bit, and so maybe you can do that. But I, I have yet to exchange chicken for, for milk. I exchange George Washington's and Abraham Lincoln's and, uh, and those guys for the milk that I get at Harris Teeter or at Food Lion or at... Aldi's or wherever it might be, I exchange that in order to have the food. Every month I, I pay a certain amount for the home that I live in, for the electricity that I utilize, for the water that we use. Every month I, I, I pay those bills because that's what's needed to live. I go to the store and I purchase clothes so that I look okay. I go to the store and I purchase hair products or, or I, I purchase uh, laundry detergent so that I don't stink when you and I interact with one another. You're thankful for that too. We need money in this society. And God knows that. Money was needed in that society too. While they were more agrarian in many ways, they still needed money. You and I need money to pay our taxes. And did you know that it is scriptural that you and I should pay our taxes? You and I do not have an exemption from paying taxes scripturally. Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. In our country, it's a certain amount that we've got to pay. I don't like paying taxes. I really don't. I'd prefer to keep that money. But when we pay our taxes, we are doing it as out of response to in obedience to what God has told us to do. And by paying taxes to our government, we are being provided with police, firemen and women, emergency care people, our military, infrastructure that takes place in the roads that are being put together and, and, uh, and are cared for, all of those kind of things when we give and pay our taxes. We pay local taxes, and we pay state taxes, and we pay federal taxes, and it gets exhausting, doesn't it? I mean, why should we pay the government more than we pay God? One of our presidential hopefuls sees it that we really shouldn't be paying the government more than we're paying God. I kind of like that guy. We need money to live in this society. It's a necessity. For our, our needs are met by the pay that we receive. But not only is money necessary, but God has given us abilities. God has given us abilities. Again, look in verse 8. It says, But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. How do you get food and clothing? How do you get money? Any idea? Work. Well, that's the legal way of getting money. Are there other ways of getting money? You can steal it. Oh, wait a minute, that's sin, isn't it? Okay, you, you can't do that. You can borrow it. Well, borrowing, Scripture kind of talks, it talks a lot about that. Be careful about going in and taking loans and those kind of things. You can beg. 
But then we are becoming a burden to society. God has given you and he's given me the ability to work. He has. He's given us a mind by which we can learn. He's given us the physical attributes by which we can engage in various forms of employment. And he has given us the ability to engage with men and women or with whatever it might be that we are particularly working with so that we can in turn receive a, a, a particular stipend or, or, or some type of money, uh, remuneration for what we are doing. We can earn a living. God has given you that ability. And I believe scripture teaches pretty clearly that you and I are supposed to work Adam and Eve in the garden God didn't just create them and say all right you guys have fun he gave them a job he gave Adam a responsibility name all the animals okay he was a zoologist that's fantastic and not only that he was a gardener he was the first gardener and so, so they, they tilled the soil. They did a number of, I mean, he had a job. He was supposed to work there. God expects us to work. In fact, there's a passage of Scripture that says, if you don't work, you don't eat. That's 2 Thessalonians 3.10. If you don't work, you don't eat. So God expects that we're to work. He's given us the ability to work, and so he wants to, as we are working, we then receive some type of, of remuneration that we can then take and provide for the needs. See, oftentimes we don't, we don't recognize the job I have is the provision that God has given to me in order to meet the needs. We, and Instead, we say, God, I need, I need, I need. I, I can't pay my bills. Well, why can't you pay your bills? I, I can't pay my bills because, well, let's work through and figure out why you really can't pay your bills. Where have you been spending your money? Well, Lord, I, I, I need cable. Really? You need cable? Yes, Lord, I need because the football season has started and I've got to watch those games. Really? But, but Lord, I, I need the internet. I, I need the new iPhone or the new Galaxy. Really? Can I tell you, you don't need the internet. You don't need a telephone. You don't need all of those things. Those are all wants and desires. Because for, I'm going to say, 1,800 years, 1,900 years, almost 2,000 years, people have lived without. I'm old enough to know when the Internet started. Life existed long before the Internet came. And we did okay. But we have moved to a place in our society where we believe we have to have these things in order to survive. Now, I'm not telling you get rid of your phones and get rid of your, your, uh, your email accounts and all those things. It's not what I'm telling you. But when we go to the Lord and say, Lord, I can't meet my needs, God's going to ask you, how are you spending your money? And if... If the desire is, if you know that you're struggling financially and you then go out and say, well, you know what, I really need to get a faster bandwidth on my internet provider and I'm going to spend extra money each month on that rather than staying where you're at, you've got a little problem. I don't think you can really go to God and say, God, provide for my needs when he's already provided for you. He's given you the ability to work and he's given you the money that you make. And if in reality you truly, truly, truly cannot make ends meet, then you need to get a second job and find a way to live within your means. I'm not a financial expert. I don't pretend to be a financial expert. Dick Hines is the financial expert. He's shaking his head no. But listen, if you have issues, go talk to Dick. <laughs> and I do mean that because he's a gifted man and can help you understand where things are out of balance in your life. God's given us the ability to earn a living. He's given us the ability to be good stewards. We're to use our money wisely, live within our means. We're to put it to work in the kingdom of God. You see, in verses 9 and 10, God gives warnings about wealth. Verse 9, it says, People who want to get rich fall into temptations and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people... In, <laughs> Uh, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. It's not a sin to be wealthy, but there are many temptations that come when wealth comes. Why? Because now you have the money that you didn't have and you have the ability to use it in ways that you never thought you would. 
how does he warn or what does he say? You know, that when one of the warnings is that they will fall into temptation and Satan's trap, foolish and harmful desires will come that are there. We talked about how, how about sin, that, de, that desire conceives and gives birth to sin. So harmful desires that are there. Ultimately, that wealth, if not in check, can lead some away from the faith. So how do you deal with that? Well, let me suggest a few things. First, clean your heart out. Clean your heart out. Let God truly be the one that's Lord of your life. Godliness and contentment bring great blessing. Second thing, surrender. Surrender to the Lord. Once I have come to the Lord and I've said, God, I want, I, want to, I want the sin removed from my life. I want this which is primary to me, which has become God. I want it in its proper place. And so I'm asking you to remove that and to fill me with yourself. Then you surrender and say, now, Lord, I'm going to give to you my pocketbook, my wallet, my desires. I'm going to ask you to help me determine truly what the needs are and that I would be a good steward of what you've given to me. And there's a third thing. Tithe. Tithe. Now, some of you, that's a, that's a word that you have no idea what it means. It means a tenth. To tithe, literally, is to give one-tenth or ten percent of that which you earn to the Lord. It's not just a scriptural principle that will lead to a good, healthy life. It's a command from the Lord. You and I have been asked to tithe. Not to tithe if we can. Not to tithe after all of our other needs have been met. But you and I have been asked to give to God first. But what often happens is that we find ourselves in debt or we find ourselves in a financial bind and the first thing we do is we say... Okay, I, I've got to pay my mortgage. I've got to pay for the electric. I, I just can't give to God this week. Who is now God of your life in that moment? Who is? Your house? Your car? All of those other things. God is no longer God in that moment. You have now placed other things on the throne room of the heart. You and I, out of obedience, are to tithe. Tithing is not just that practice that is uh, good for us, but it is an act of sacrifice. Sacrifice is always, <laughs> a sacrifice always is painful, isn't it? It should be. I mean, when God sacrificed his son, it was painful. When, when Abraham took Isaac up on the mountain, and he was commanded to sacrifice Isaac there on that altar, he knew that it was a painful... I mean, can you imagine walking up that mountain with Isaac knowing that you have to sacrifice him on an altar? Can you imagine the anguish that was going on through, uh, through uh, Abraham's heart? And Isaac knew nothing about it until he got up there and everything had been assembled, everything had been put together, and then Abraham put Isaac on the altar. And in that moment, Isaac realized this is a huge sacrifice. It doesn't say that Abraham and Isaac fought over it either. Because I believe that Isaac actually became a willing sacrifice. Abraham was an old man, and Isaac was a young man. But Abraham trusted the Lord and believed that God would do an amazing thing. And so that which was most important in his life, he took and he laid him upon an altar, and he was prepared for the ultimate sacrifice. And Isaac, I believe, laid there knowing that this sacrifice was tremendous for his father, but even more tremendous for himself. And an angel stayed the hand and said, I've provided a lamb. And Isaac went, Whew. And then he played in his mind all the way down how God had provided, how God had provided. The provision came because of the sacrifice. 
You see that? God provided the lamb because Abraham laid Isaac on the altar. It was faith. God will meet our needs when we faithfully give to him what belongs to him. You see, when you and I tithe, it's not just an act of sacrifice, but it places God in the correct place. It says, God owns me, and therefore he owns my wallet. He owns my bank account, and he can take and do with my bank account anything he wants because he's God. And if I am giving that to God, if I'm allowing God to be the Lord of all, the Lord of my finances, then he's going to instruct me how to best use my finances. So why wouldn't I give to him first? It's an act of obedience. It's an act of worship. When we give to the Lord and when we give that regularly unto him, it is ascribing unto him glory to his name for he is worthy. Again, God doesn't need our money, but it's an act of worship that we give to him. God will then take and use our gifts to impact the world. Finally, it's an act of evangelism. But you never thought about giving as an act of evangelism, did you? But when you and I give, it really is an act of evangelism. Why? Because we are declaring to a watching world that there is a king who loves us, who gave himself for us, And out of our joy, out of our expression of worship unto him, we want to declare to the world the glory of who he is. And so we are going to give back unto him. Why? Because we want him to be honored and his name or his fame to go around this world. And so God's going to take that gift and he's going to use it to present himself all around this world. Isn't that an incredible thing? When you give, it's evangelism. There's a lot more we can talk about, but we're not going to. But I'm going to ask you this question. Who's the God of your life? Is it God? Or are you trying to play God? If you give yourself to Him, He'll take your wallet too. And if you give your wallet to him, he's going to use it. Folks, walk around your home. When you go home, just walk around. Be thankful for the blessings that God has given as you sit in that chair or sit on that, that couch, you know how much it costs. As you listen to music or you watch that show, you know how much of an investment it was. As you walk around the property line, you know how much the investment is. As you turn lights on and you turn lights off, you know how much it's costing as you drive that car, all of those things you have, you know how much value you've put there. And, and I'm going to say, that's not a bad thing. That's a, God has provided. Thank Him for that. But then I want you to consider this. How does God's house look? How are God's people cared for? What about the international workers? Are their needs being met? What about the benevolent fund? Is it where it needs to be? We live in beautiful homes, but often the last thing we think about is caring for God's house. God has provided 10 acres and two beautiful buildings. Are these buildings, I know they're brick and mortar, 
Are they as nice as your home? Will you invest in it as much as you've invested in your own home? See, the church is much more, though, than the buildings. The church are the individuals that come. It's easier, I believe, to give 10% to come to the work day and make sure the church looks beautiful. And I think the church should look beautiful because it's a testimony to the community about what we think of God. If you know anything about me, then you understand that I believe that God deserves our best. And so we need to invest appropriately in the things that we utilize here at the church. And I won't apologize for that. I think we need to be fiscally responsible, but I do believe we need to invest in the best because he deserves it. And it communicates to the world that God is amazing. You know, the Catholics and the uh, uh, Orthodox and the Anglicans, they have a little bit of this right. Their facilities are breathtaking. Unfortunately, many of their facilities, while they're breathtaking, the Spirit is not there. But the greater need... Again, it's easier for me to give 10% than it is for me to go next door or down the street or across the hallway and say to someone, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Let me tell you about the greatest thing that could happen in your life. I'm willing to invest my finances in a lot of ways. But oftentimes we're not really willing to invest our time in the things that really matter. Look to your left, look to your right. Around you, you're going to find empty chairs. Fill them. Not because of this church but because he's worth it. Invest in people. Invest in God's kingdom. And you'll be blessed. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? We're going to sing that hymn again in just a moment. Great is thy faithfulness is our closing this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed. It's been a tough morning. Maybe this morning you're here and you could not say with clarity that God truly is on the throne because there are other things that are on the throne of your life. For you give more time and energy to those things and finances to those things than really to Him who deserves it. And you just want to say, Pastor... Um, pray for me today because God's working in my heart about that and I want him to be enthroned so just slip your hand up put it back down I, I want to pray for you I see it yep yep I see it quite a number yep I see it God around the room different ones that are saying hey there's I want Jesus to be on the throne of my heart and I don't want to I, I don't want to let there be anything else there and it's so easy for us to allow it and it happens at different times Lord but right now in this moment in this uh, season of my life something else has taken taken that place and I pray that you would remove that and that you would be enthroned there help my priorities to be set in the right way Right now, it seems that they're a little askew. I pray, Father, that you would enable them to deal with that as they bring that to you this moment, as the interior is being cleaned out. Fill it with yourself. I ask, Father, as we end our time together, that we would go out recognizing all we have needed, your hands have provided, for you have indeed been
been so faithful, even when we have not been faithful. We ask your blessing on us and on this time as we respond in your name. Amen. I invite you to stand where you are, please, and we're going to sing this hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. I have the words here, but you do not. I'm sorry. That's okay. Many of you do know it. But as we sing, I invite you to respond as the Lord places it on your heart. If God's convicted you, and honestly, you haven't been tithing, and you, you really you want to take care of that today, offering plates are on each side of the, bill, each side of the room. Go take care of it. You've not been one who has invested in the lives of people and you want to ask God forgiveness for that, come to the altar. You honestly are saying, Lord, I have not been contented. I want to be contented in your presence. The communion table is set up over there to the right. You respond as he leads. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercy 